Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I've set up a 3D printing bureau, which is a bit like a photo processing shop, but for 3D. Uh, people send us files, and we print them on demand. We also do a bit of the design. Here's some examples of the stuff we've done. In the last sort of two or three years, I've made over 25,000 models, uh, ranging from big corporations, who you probably all, all know the names of, down to seven-year-old boys and everywhere in between. So we've got this quite sort of unique insight into what is going on. But what really excites me is the people who are, who've got an idea and they just go ahead and do it. You know, they get they, they they pull their finger out and actually get the design work done. Now, before these uh, sort of 3D printers came along, people were a bit put off by things. You know, they'd see this complex design, they'd be like, you know, how on earth am I going to make this? How am I going to how am I going to design it? You know, I've, I've got no skills in it. You know, they think if they want to take it on to manufacture, how am I going to set up all these giant production runs? You know, what, I'm, what am I going to do? And what about the admin? You know, there's just way too much stuff going on. Everything suddenly feels a little impossible. Now, <laughs> that was until these things came along. And then all of a sudden, everything felt a little bit easier. Brief bit on how it works. So it's gone a bit louder, sorry. Um, I'm going to show you using my favorite medium. Uh, it's basically Lego. So 3D printing is the process of taking digital data and then laying it down in physical format from the ground upwards. <laughs> now, if I was going to show you a real printer like this, it's a bit baffling to see. So that's why I like showing with the Lego at the beginning. Um, this is actually currently printing one layer, laying a new layer across, drops it down 0.1 of a mil, and then prints another layer. And it does that about 3,000 times before it makes the object. There are lots and lots of different types of machines. Now, these range from the one you just saw, a few hundred thousand pounds, down to uh, desktop models, which can cost just a few hundred pounds. And they obviously range in, in qualities. And you know, if you pay a few hundred pounds, you get something that can produce something. If you pay a lot more, you get something that can produce something absolutely amazing. But the, it, there's no perfect 3D printer. They're all good and bad in, in various ways. There's also lots and lots of different types of materials. Um, you can print, majority of printers print in plastics. Uh, you can print in metals, you can print in ceramics, you can print in glass, you can even 3D print food, you can print chocolate, you can... NASA are trying to do something about 3D printing pizzas, which I'm not going to go into now, but it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I'll run quickly through the advantages. Um, so the first thing is no tooling. Now, traditional... This is an injection mold here. Uh, it's a traditional way of uh, manufacturing uh, plastic items. Now, these tools cost tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds to produce. Um, with 3D printing, because you're building from a platform and building layer on top of layer, you don't have to pay for this. So you don't have to put this hundred, maybe, you know, hundred thousand pound investment up front. Um, you just literally are paying for the material and the time of the machine. Now it, it's a little bit more expensive to produce uh, from a 3D printer than it would be once you've got the tool, but you don't have to buy the tool, which is the good thing. Complexity. Uh, again, because you're building layer by layer, you don't have to worry about whether this part can be ejected from a mold, whether a tool can get in there and cut it, whether you, know, whether you can whittle away by hand at it. Um, this part here is a scale model of a rig that goes in the North Sea for a, some sort of pumping unit, and that was all printed in one piece. That's how it came off the printer, um, which is a way you would have never been able to manufacture stuff before. You can do things like working mechanisms, uh, lo lots and lots of things, shapes inside shapes inside shapes. Sometimes I don't know why you need shapes inside shapes inside shapes, but you can do it, and that's the interesting point. Also, because it's digital, yeah, I've put my nice corporate image here. Um, you can see, you can send stuff around the world. So someone in Hong Kong can send it to China, bad example, send it to America, that's a bit further away. Um, uh, so <laughs> in the UK, maybe to South Africa, something like that. Um, you can see where things go. Um, so yeah, and, and obviously you don't need to do, you don't need to ship it because it's just being transferred over the internet. Difficulties. Now I was going to call this disadvantages, but I, difficulties is probably a better way of doing it because it may sound amazing and it may sound like you can just print anything off, but this is not necessarily true. There are things you've got to do. Like if you imagine you're writing a letter, when you click print, that's not the hard bit. It's the writing the letter in the first place that is the difficult bit. And that writing of the letter is called CAD, or computer-aided design. So these are reverse-engineered. So someone's taken a physical object and drawn it up in 3D on the computer. You then have to take this file and then print that. Now, they don't have to be already existing parts. You can design and invent as much as you want. Um, but you have to print from this digital data called CAD. Uh, how do I get around that? Learn it yourself. Um, 
Really good. People who learn it themselves are the kind of people who probably take the stairs instead of the lift. You know, these guys will, they'll go out and they'll do it and they'll learn how to do this skill and they'll use it again and again. And the kind of people who go and learn to how, to, how to do this design are the kind of people who are probably going to come up with more than one idea anyway. You could not learn it, uh, which is, you know, the lazy way out, the person who takes the lift. Um, either, either that or they have no conviction in their idea and they're just not really interested in taking it on to the next level. Not necessarily a thumbs down, it was a bit harsh, but I didn't have any other stock images, so I just rotated that thumb that way. <laughs> <laughs> or you could pay someone to do it. Now, this looks like a, a, a lazy option. It's not a lazy option at all. Paying a professional to do something is often the best way to do it. You know, if you have an idea of the ideal house you want to live in and you draw it out, you're probably not going to make it. You're probably going to get a builder to build it for you because they're going to do it really well and, you know, you can, you can trust them. So... Getting a professional to help you out with your design is very, very advisable, strongly advisable. 3D scanning as well as the other one. Um, 3D scanning is great in practice, in, on, sorry, in, in theory, but not so great in practice. You can see here, this is a scanner, desktop scanner, projecting a laser line over, over an object. And now there's a camera as well, which is one of these two holes here. Um, that camera picks up the deformation and deviation of the line, and there's a complex algorithm gives it a 3D form uh, on, on, on screen. Now, it's great if you're doing objects where you've got, you just want the outside of something, but anything with internal complex geometry or you know, driven dimensions and specific holes, especially, especially in engineering parts, 3D scanning isn't necessarily the best way to do it. It's quite often better to draw it up in CAD because you can draw it to the thousandth of a millimeter perfectly in CAD. It does take a bit longer, though. No tooling. Back on this. Uh, no tooling is also a slight disadvantage because you, when you tool up a machine, as I said earlier, hundreds of thousands of pounds, but the parts that come out of them cost pennies each. Whereas if you're 3D printing something, it's usually quite a few pounds per item. So with this, you have economy of scale. With 3D printing, no tooling, no economy of scale. So if you, one item will cost, say, X, and then 1,000 items will be 1,000X, whereas it's, it's the other way around. I can't work out the mathematical equation for economies of scale, but you kind of get it. The layers as well. So because you're building layer by layer, it's, it's its greatest weakness, but it's also its biggest disadvantage as well. Uh, the layers are mainly visible, is, is what a lot of people, is the first thing people pick up when they see a 3D print. They're like, oh, what are all of these lines? And it's, that's, that's the way it's made. Um, they are, they're, they're not the most visually appealing things. Um, and when people, a lot of people don't care how something's manufactured, they just care how much it costs and what it looks like and what the quality's like. And if they see something that is a bit, rough around the edges, you know, it, it's exciting at the moment for us because we're like, wow, that's been 3D printed. But if in 10 years' time when this technology is quite normal, they're probably going to be like, oh, it's been 3D printed. I wanted it injection molded to be much nicer. But, yeah, uh, you can, you can post-process this, smooth it off, get it, like, paint it, but then again, you're adding more processes to the production, which then kind of goes out the window of uh, whether it's viable as a mainstream of manufacture. And also, with the layers, using they use Lego again, um, you have a grain. So, you are, you're because you're building up on top of each other here, um, you've got strength in the top and you've got strength in the sides, but then if you twist it sideways and push in, it's not going to be very strong. And this, if you've got thin features like clips on, on plastic items, then this can be a bit of a weakness. I've forgotten which slide's coming next. Ah, there we go. These are my, these are my little prompters. Uh, so, I'm here really to talk about the creativity and those ideas that are being born not because of, but helped by 3D printing. Um, we all know some, someone who has got this amazing idea that they're waiting to, for the right time to develop it and take it to the next level, and they've probably been sitting on it for 10 or 20 years, and they're like, no, I'm just waiting for the time to come, it'll be okay, don't worry, and they never actually do anything with it. So I've actually, well, I want to talk about the people who are starting to do this. And since this sort of mainstreamness of 3D printing's come out, people are coming out the woodwork and being like, oh, yeah, I've got this idea. And then, and then they come up and, you know, they could have actually got it done before via different methods. But because people are seeing a lot of designs and creations being made to, by, via 3D printers, they're getting very excited and then they're like, oh, it's, it's time, it's time. So I'm going to talk to you about these people. Steve Modell, or model, I, I can never know which, it's, which way around it is, but um, anyway, Steve is a, a little bit of an entrepreneur. He was a snowboarder and a thespian. Um, I don't know what he's wearing there, but it's, I think it's a Glimeborn, he told me, but uh, pretty cool. 
Anyway, Steve uh, did a ski season, and uh, he obviously, being a thespian, likes filming, and being a snowboarder, he was obviously going to buy one of these. Uh, if you don't know what this is, it's a GoPro. Uh, it's a very high definition, very rugged camera that's great for filming extreme sports and things like that. Now, he did this ski season, and he came back, and he wanted to get a proper job, and he'd also been developing a, uh, an idea for this as well. So he wanted to do, after seeing the sunset over the Alps every day, he wanted to get a nice time lapse of it, but wanted to rotate it. So he did this, did some research on the internet and saw how people were sticking them on top of egg timers and then doing time lapse photography. So he has now designed this little piece here, uh, which is a, a basically an adapter. So you can mount your camera onto, on, top of the, uh, on top of the egg timer, and the gl glorified egg timer, uh, and rotate it, and it takes a photo every second, and you get a fantastic little thing. Now, this is a bit jittery. It's much smoother. I, I, I compressed the file of the video and kind of killed the smoothness. I'm sorry about that, Steve. Now, what, re what I really like about this project is Steve is wanting to make this into a tangible product. Um, there are lots of these on the internet uh, that pe where people have just duct taped their uh, GoPro onto, a, onto an egg timer and there are a few products existing out there that are very similar to it and so we're not, we're not trying to say that he's invented this but what he's done is he's, he's gone out and he's, he's taken his time to learn how to do this CAD and he's come up with this idea and he's been, this, that's about the 20th different variation of the model he's been doing with us and it is, his dedication to it is fantastic and, and it's, if it hadn't been for him hearing about 3D printing on the news he would never would have taken this idea forward and I think that's kind of, kind of inspiring. Joe Bigley, uh, the improviser. So Joe has a great job. He works on the Lion King uh, in London as a set designer, and mainly uh, Timon is, is, is the one he works with. Um, and they have had problems with the legs. And so these legs are all animated. Has, has anyone seen this? Yeah, you probably know then. The legs are animated. Um, and they've had quite a few problems with this because the legs kept seizing up, and it's meant to, I think it's meant to bend here as well. Um, and they were originally using machined aluminium parts and some tubes and things like that, but they had problems with the accuracy of the machine so that the tubes all lined up and the tubes were wearing out and they were unpredictable when they wore out. So Joe, being a bright spot that he, did, he is, he also put his mind, learned, learned a bit of CAD and uh, designed these, which looks a bit of a mess at the moment, but these are lots and lots of different parts for, for the leg uh, with the idea that printing them on the 3D printer, they would come out, they would all be the same, whereas but when they were hand machined before, there was this uh, tolerance and dimensional inaccuracy which was leading to ca cause the problems. And he realized that he could make loads of these for quite cheap. And now, the internal working mechanism of the leg looks a bit like this. Now, imagine that Timon's leg is on the outside of that and this is on the inside. But the great thing about this is it's a great application for 3D printing because it's to tool up a machine to make these parts traditionally in plastic would be very expensive and machining them by other ways like CNC uh, would be uh, a lot more expensive and a lot more time consuming and seeing as they wear out a little bit then he's very happy with himself uh, seeing as they wear, they wear out quite quickly um, it is, uh, it, 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 it's not suitable to do it those methods so with 3D printing you can, you can, quite, you can get your dimensional accuracy and you can replace them quite frequently as well Gareth Jones, the hobbyist. So Gareth uh, is a car nut and an engineer, and he wanted to, uh, I don't know how to say it, chip onto it off his old block. Get his son to do what he did anyway. So he bought him a, uh, bought him a scale electric set, and Gareth had one of these when he was younger, and absolutely loved it. And then when he when his, uh, got his son's one, he saw how much faster they were and how they stuck to the track like glue, and they kind of lost the nostalgia of what they used to be. So Gareth started Chase Cars, which is his own company um, set up where he's designed his own chassis. Now this is, I've got one over here actually. I won't hold it, I'll show the video. Uh, so the front wheel is the steer and the front and rear axles are independent of the chassis and sprung loaded. So this means when you go around the corner, the car skid out and slides sideways and the whole body rolls. Now, isn't that, oh, here's the fun bit. You can watch them in action. Um, so now he's, he's specifically designed them with lower grip tyres and all this body roll to make the cars look like they're really working and I mean this definitely is a first world problem isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, but 
But it did, it, there was also a problem in the first world that it solved as well. Gareth had actually changed jobs and had taken quite a big salary cut and actually set this up as a business. So not only did he do these designs for him and his son, but he's also sharing them with the world because, I mean, most people aren't going to spend their time designing and drawing this up. So he's given them the option to have these uh, in, their, in their lovely warm living rooms on a Christmas, on a Christmas day. Um, and uh, I always get a bit mesmerized by it. I just... Uh, <laughs> I kind of want to get my own one now. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's, he's been helping his uh, son, and uh, I just, I'm just going to mumble through the rest of this. Cause it's <laughs> anyway, that's really cool, isn't it? <laughs> Leonardo, the future. So Leonardo is uh, one of our youngest. In fact, he's the seven-year-old boy I was referring to at the beginning of the talk. Now... Leonardo and his father sent us this picture, which is quite obviously a dinosaur car boat with a bathtub in the back and taps for uh, driving forwards on bike wheels. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and Leonardo's father was adamant that we had this made. Uh, so we sent it off to a very talented designer, Eddie Brown, uh, who turned it into this. <laughs> so yeah, you've got the taps on the front here, you've got your office chair here, bike wheels as requested, tiller for the tail, which actually moves independently. And when I was talking about you can print mechanisms, well, this is technically a mechanism, so the tail actually moves independently from the rest of it, and the wheels turn. The taps don't, though, sorry. And it lazy, I think that was, on the designer side. <laughs> uh, and th that was the print of it, and the presentation. And he, yeah, very happy, very happy boy. Now, what really touched me about this was his father's attitude. And this, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, this was quite a few hundred pounds to get it to this stage once you go through all the design process and all that. But the father said that, what well, was the most exciting bit about it was, um, he said that his son, Leonardo, wanted to be a, an inventor. And this was his first invention. And if he gets this made and puts it on his desk, for the rest of his life, he'll have this on his desk as the inspiration of what started him and where he came from. And I think that's a very commendable, commendable way to spend a few hundred pounds. <laughs> Dr. Stephen Hicks, the visionary, um, and I use that as a pun, excuse the pun, and you'll find out why. So Do Dr. Stephen Hicks, Steve, and his team have developed these. Now, earlier when I said these are uh, solving first world problems, this isn't a first world problem, this is a really, really great thing. Uh, so these glasses are to help the visually impaired navigate using, not, n but not, in, not um, restoring their sight, but enhancing what they already have. Now, this is a complex circuit board, which I don't really know how it works. Um, and there's a couple of sensors in here and here, uh, which will sense how far away an object is. Uh, and it, what it will do is it will highlight via sorry, these OLED screens, which are clear, transparent screens. Now, when you, when you look through them, this is one of the early prototypes, so it's very low resolution. Uh, it identifies objects around you and near you that will, uh, are, are going to make an impact in, in your, you know, w what's near you. So you can see the walls identified here and the humans identified here. What it'll do is it'll give this a color and this a different color as well. And then it'll also give this a, a, and this a different light intensity. Now the light intensity is brighter when you're closer and dimmer when you're further away. So all of a sudden you have depth perception, which changing from, now I, I'm not gonna pretend I know what it's like to be visually impaired, but I can imagine that there are a lot of blurs and it's very difficult to define the distance between them. So something like walking down a street can be, for me and you, very easy, but for someone who has visual impurities can be very, very, very challenging. And the idea of this is to help that and enhance their depth perception and these day-to-day -day tasks we find easy without surgery at all. And so why 3D printing? Um, because scientists are scientists and they like to stick things on things. This is the original prototype and it had a, an Xbox Connect sensor on the front, some LEDs, and all strapped to a pair of ski goggles. They were walking around. And then uh, we came in and helped them out, got them down to this stage. And at this stage, it's still looking kind of a bit nerdy and a bit 80s, um, which I think is kind of cool. But um, when these become, end up looking like normal glasses, then you really have a tangible project that can change the world in, in, a, in a small way. So uh, these, what do these guys have in common? Uh, they have in common the fact that they've got ideas, they've had ideas and they've wanted to do it, uh, and they've come out. And what 3D printing has done is it's given them the, the ability to stand out and, 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 and go ahead with their designs and follow through with what they wanted to do. Now, 
all of those things actually technically could have been made without a 3D printer, but the question is, would they have been made without a 3D printer? I think what 3D printing is, is an enabler for creativity and an enhancer and a catalyst for it. So my advice, if you've got an idea, I, well, I've, I spent a long time trying to come up with a, a clat, catchy sentence to say, if you've got an idea what to do and how to involve it in 3D printing. And I was thinking about it, I was actually watching telly and there was this um, panda bear um, <laughs> from the Foxes thing doing a, a mafia accent, talking about his new biscuits he's promoting. And, and he said, um, I've got to get it right now, hang on. Try it, you won't regret it. But if you don't try it, you might regret it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just thought that's a really good way of summing up. If you've got an idea, go for it. And probably use 3D printing. Uh, I'd like to dedicate any applause to the guys behind the projects and myself and uh, like to thank everyone else here today and the organisers. Thank you very much.